spent than we are today looking at the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians reminded me in study of that um, because the city, essentially, the ancient city of Corinth was essentially known as the Las Vegas of its time. Well, we have a Las Vegas, not too far off of Route 66, and uh, known to many from the 1940s as a place where the mob laundered their money. And today it's so family-oriented, right? They tried to change their image a little bit, and... Uh, but now they're advertising right back like they did that um, for you to come and uh, be extravagant. But um, interesting little bit of history about Las Vegas is that it's the, f- the first person of European ancestry to enter the Las Vegas Valley was Rafael Rivera, who scouted the area in 1821 as part of Antonio Hermajo's expedition to open up a trade route, the old Spanish trail between New Mexico and California. Rivera named the valley Las Vegas, or the Meadows, after its spring-watered grasses. The city, founded mainly by dam builders, ranchers, and Mormon railroad workers, quickly found that its greatest asset was not the springs, but their vices. Gambling and prostitution provided a perfect home for Bugsy Siegel and East Coast organized crime. The 1940s boom brought drug money and racketeering building casinos that laundered it. Visitors came to partake in what the casinos offered, low-cost luxury and the thrill of fantasies fulfilled. Sin City was the new moniker according to the History Channel. So there you go. And I've only been through that a couple times, but like I say, try to change your image. I think there are more family-oriented things. We had a church plant there a few years back, and uh, it had some um, interesting qualities to it. So they were building a new building, and one of the casinos donated all donated its chandeliers to the church. It was the most beautiful inside I've ever seen in a church building with crystal chandeliers. Uh, and the pastor, who uh, sadly uh, has passed away um, a couple of years ago, his wife was one of the Las Vegas showgirls when they met, and she came to know the Lord, and such. So I remember being in a meeting, and someone saying, how can you establish a church in Sin City? And he goes, where better to establish a church than Sin City? And so not everybody in Las Vegas is, of course, captivated by its entertainment. And, uh, but it is an interesting place nonetheless. Traveling on to our New Testament destination, I titled this lesson, Clueless Church in Sin City. Many consider of all the churches that are mentioned in all the letters that the Apostle Paul has wrote to churches, uh, because the title in your Bible says the first epistle, An epistle is a letter. So the first of his letters to the Corinthians is to a church that appears to be clueless to me. They are, uh, and we'll talk about how that they are, you know, were founded properly and such, but that even the best of intentions can sometimes lead entire churches down um, religious roads that don't, glorify the Lord. In the first three verses of this book, we find this. 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sothenes our brother, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of, the, of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, uh, verses 10 through 11, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So there's the introduction to the book, and then an introduction into why Paul felt obligated to write this letter, which we still have as part of our inspired Bible to let us know uh, information today. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the information you've given us today in this book. And as we um, go through it and see the various aspects of things that are discussed here, help us, Lord, to be mindful of the need to always be uh, aware of the status and the place we are with you, that we don't judge too greatly uh, other things and other places, but that we establish our own walk with you and establish it according to your will. Watch over us this morning. We ask it in your son's name. Amen. So we have the introduction written by Paul. We know by other references, particularly from the book of Corinth, and that he wrote this while he was actually at Ephesus. Some of you may have a subscript under the last verse of this book that says that from Philippi. That's not part of the original text. That's a textual note put in by a translator somewhere along the line. The original text that we translate from does not have those words. So many times those are highlighted, and in many cases, even King James Version, those words have been left off, properly left off. But you may have that following ch uh, chapter 16, verse 24. Uh, if you do, realize that's not really part of the original scripture. This says that he has written to the ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church. Remember, we've been talking about that, and we, as a particularly landmark missionary Baptists, we make a great emphasis to that. The New Testament church is not universal, that it is always a visible local assembly. Um, church never was meant to be what you can't see. It's always been what you can see. So it's local. And it's an assembly. And it's part uh, of the Lord's, uh, what he founded, as part of his church. And today, um, we still follow that. The word ecclesia meant, and still means today in, in Koine Greek, or ancient Greek, and in modern Greek, more or less, assembly. In Latin, it's very close. You will see in many Hispanic churches, you'll look at it and you'll see it looks like it says ecclesia, right, because of the Latin. And so, assembly, and assembly uh, is what that word means. He wanted to differentiate that this was an assembly of God, not just any assembly that anybody would go to. So it's not just a town gathering. It's not just something people go to for fun. It's not a civic organization. It is part of a spiritual house that uh, in the city of Corinth is meeting there. And Corinth is an interesting place. This is a picture of the ruins. It's in the southern part of Greece. And um, the mountain behind it is called Mount Acorinth, which simply means Upper Corinth. And you can see, uh, I think by the top of that, you can see a little, uh, if we were to expand that, there's a building on top of, this, of that mountain. And that's the temple to Aphrodite. 
And part of the reason that Corinth is recognized as a sinful place, Sin City, was because of what happened up in that old temple above Corinth. The way this church was planted, we'll have to look back to Acts chapter 18. So here's where Corinth begins forming. And uh, we read that from Acts 18. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus, lately from Italy and his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come to Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So he came, abode, became a tent maker for a while. So uh, Paul had a, had a side gig, if you will, had some secular employment when he needed it. Some today don't always understand that when I use the term secular employment because I work, I work for the Opportunity Foundation during the week. And uh, yes, sometimes it causes problems in trying to do everything I need to do as a pastor and that sort of thing. But I've, for the most part of my life, most of the time, I have been either planting a new church or working with churches that were small and, and building them back, and I've always had to work outside. Taking some comfort that even the Apostle Paul had to do that on occasion. And he found two Jewish people who we're not seeing seen by this that they were believers, but he abode with them, I would think that that might indicate that they were sympathetic to him. And where did he go and preach? To churches? There wasn't a church yet. So he went to the place where religious people were gathering, the synagogue and uh, organizations like that. So the church in Corinth came about from converting people from Judaism to Christianity, from them becoming believers, uh, of course, following belief, then they need to have scriptural baptism, and they covenant together. They, they promise uh, to be a church, essentially, and carry on. That's the beginning. It's the most basic stage of 1 Corinthians. Bruce Worson uh, says this about Corinth, though, as a city. Near the top is an acropolis, i.e. fortress, and at the highest summit was the temple of Aphrodite. As many as 1,000 temple prostitutes would come down to the city with follow me written on their sandals to entice men back to the temple. In ancient Greece, prostitutes were nicknamed Corinthian girls. Corinth was known for luxury, pleasure, and immorality, similar to how we view Las Vegas. Oh, there you go. It's no big surprise that the Corinthian church struggled with worldliness and sexual sin. And unlike Paul's usual few days or weeks, he spent a year and a half strengthening the Corinthians. So it took a while to get this church established. And here's what we know about it. So here begins the summary and our survey of it. They allowed within their relationship uh, an immoral situation to develop in chapter 5. Chapter 7, 8, and 12, uh, he answers questions that they have. They ought to have known as believers, but nevertheless, they're asking him again some questions, and he answers them. And one of the major ones towards the end of this book is about the resurrection. We see in chapter 11 that they misused and abused the Lord's Supper. They misunderstood. They must have been Baptists, right? And uh, of course, well, all faiths were Baptist. They didn't use that name that back then. But we are tied and linked to them doctrinally. The idea of a potluck. What would be more Baptist than to have a potluck? Except that they missed that, mixed it up with the Lord's Supper, which is not a time to eat, but a time to remember and celebrate what the Lord uh, provided and did for us. So this really brings about the theme, which is in uh, chapter 3 and verses 1 through 23, that essentially say, 
Grow up. So what's the theme? The first, I could stop right now, don't even have to preach anymore, and you go, okay, well, why don't you do that? Because I have more to say, so I'm going to speak longer. I put too much trouble in providing this to get out of the pulpit right now, so you'll have to endure me. But essentially, the rest of the book is them being told to grow up. And let's read. This is the longest section of Scripture I will have this morning, so endure me. Uh, if you have your Bible and you have struggled with reading this on the, on the wall, I would encourage you to chat, turn to chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3. And we're going to read all of these verses. And I've highlighted a couple things. First of all, just notice what he says to, to begin with. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even unto, unto babes in Christ. The word carnal there is, is carnus. It's another word for meat. I always think that he's kind of saying, now listen, you meatheads. Couldn't talk to you the way I need to. So, ever had somebody call you that? Well, Paul's essentially calling the Corinthian church that. And he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, fleshly, meaty. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For, another, no, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day that shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If every man's work ab abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem, seemeth to be wise in his world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. All of that sets the stage for what's the problem in Corinth. And that is, is that they had their little factions. Paul had a faction. Apollos had a faction. People saying, well, I got baptized by Apollos. You didn't. And Paul's saying, hey, give me a break. I planted. Apollos built on top of that. And why? Because God gives the increase in glory to that. It doesn't matter. This church has already in its history, and I say a short history because it's not been here for uh, eons. You know, a few decades is short in the lifespan of a New Testament church. I have preached in churches in the United States that uh, in some of our churches in the South are uh, over 100 years old. They were in existence before the Civil War. And there's a church building near 
uh, Benton, Arkansas, Kentucky Missionary Baptist Church, that the whole congregation, oldest church, uh, I believe, east of the Mississippi in existence, uh, moved from Kentucky. The whole church decided, yeah, we're moving from Kentucky. We're going to Arkansas. Now, I don't know why they'd do that. I've been to Kentucky. I've been to Arkansas. I didn't see anything in Arkansas worth moving from Kentucky to. But, you know, nevertheless, they, they said, well, we're going to do that. They built a building. And part of that original building still stands. That would make them, at this point, maybe 150 years old. So there are churches that are well-established and long time. The point of that? The point is, is that that can have several pastors. In our, in our day and time, I know of only a few pastors that have been in a particular church for more than, you know, five, ten years, and some maybe 20, and an even smaller handful that may have been in the pulpit most of their ministry, which could be, you know, 30 or 40 years. Uh, Brother Counts is one of those down there in Bent, and uh, he is still uh, preaching with vigor, and uh, we, we wish him a good and continued happy life. But um, even in my tenure here, a few years, and a few years before me, uh, with Brother Morey and others that have been here, we understand that none of us is the secret to the success of this church. We all are just building. We're all putting material to the construction of a building that is spiritual. The church has nothing to do with these facilities. And we can assemble wherever we choose. We choose to meet here on a regular basis. We, as a corporate body in this state, own this particular piece of property. And so it's nice to meet here. Some of our forefathers would have been, just thought this would be the greatest thing. This is almost like the temple to meet in a building like this. And yet we complain, right? It gets hot, it gets cold. Whatever, we think we've got it bad. But we need to cons be concerned more with the spiritual construction. And this is what Corinth is called to do, to have unity in their church. Quit arguing among yourselves. Quit setting aside the intimate, basic details of what a New Testament church is and grow up, get mature. We see this uh, from chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, that says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. So it's significant enough that Paul says, I have already judged. And a lot of people tell us all about judging, right? Oh, we shouldn't be judging. Paul says, if I were there, I'd have the same opinion. The Gentile world, all right, Sin City out there says, this is even a bad thing. How can you let it exist in your New Testament in the church without dealing with it? And so the point is, is that they were to exercise discipline. One of our doctrines, the things that we make, that makes us unique among much of the Christian community, is our belief that the Lord's Supper is restricted to faithful members of that New Testament church. And one reason we believe that is not because we're trying to restrict anybody, but that we have no way of judging, and we are told to both judge ourselves and the church judges herself as being worthy to take the Lord's Supper. Sometimes the visions and problems in a church can be such that they don't observe the Lord's Supper for a period of time. There can be problems that arise. It can be logistics and many different things. But the idea of it is, is that we know about our membership. Guess who we don't know about? And that's anybody else's. As much as I counted a privilege to have sister churches and no members within it and different churches throughout the United States and they are welcome to visit and enjoy worship with us but when it comes time for the Lord's Supper 
we cannot allow them to observe it with us because we don't know what they're doing and we don't have uh, an idea of their daily walk. Only New Testament churches know what their membership is doing. And people will say, well, you're judging. And people hate the word judge. Luke chapter 6, verses 41 and 42 deal with judging. And simply say this. Let's, let's just go over that verse very quickly. That if I point something out in your life that's sinful, that I should be aware that the fingers point back at me and that if I point out uh, a splinter that's a problem for you, I should look at my own life, which may have a tube of four stuck in it. And having done that, I can help you if my sin doesn't restrict us from talking honestly about our lives. We judge all the time. We are told to judge correctly. Don't make this a lifestyle, but most of the time when we judge or people say, quit judging, it's because they don't like to have their lifestyle brought into light of the New Testament. I don't like to be told I'm doing something wrong. I don't like that in any kind of my, uh, part of my life. I don't particularly like to be told to take the trash out. I know the trash needs to go out. My wife may say, but sometime this week or this month would be good as opposed to your schedule of things. So I do listen to her, and she corrects me sometimes. I have attempted to correct her a few times, but that hasn't gone well. So uh, let's just focus on the idea of our own needs, right? In whatever it is in life. None of us like to be found to be wrong. The old TV show, you know, uh, remember the Fonz? Uh, he couldn't say wrong. I'm root, root. He couldn't say the word wrong. It was wrong. Well, sometimes we're like that. Spiritually, we have to get over that. Spiritually, sometimes a pastor will come into a home, and we have to have a talk about something that's going on that should not be going on, a lifestyle that's being lived. And uh, others may do the same thing. It's not just up to the pastor, although pastors are often the ones that people think that they got to account to. For some reason, does it say on my forehead, I'm about to judge you? Because that's what some people think, that it must be shining off my forehead. I don't know. Because even in the world, people that know that I'm a preacher uh, sometimes will uh, act different when I come into their presence. And the only thing I can figure, it must say off of my forehead, get ready to be judged. <laughs> you know, It's silly, isn't it? It doesn't matter who it is. We just don't like that. But we need to be correct about it. And the Corinthian church was completely ignoring it. What? what? Trouble? You talking about trouble? What? What trouble? Are you not? Paul says, I'm not even there and I know what's going on. Then we're told, in unity, choose two different lifestyles. Either be chaste and single or strong in your marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses, verses 1 through 5. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man to not touch a woman. And he will expand upon it because Paul, at this time, in some relationships, is essentially living single and chaste. I'm not sure about the result of. He was at some point married in order to be part of the religious organization he was a part of through the Jews. But, nevertheless, nevertheless, because I don't want you to live like the rest of the Corinthians, don't submit yourself to fornication. Get a wife. And a wife a husband. And you do this. You let the husband render into the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may, be, may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontency. 
What is he saying? The whole point of you becoming man and wife is to be together. To be help one another live in this area we live in that has problems, particularly uh, a licentious problem. And it will be harder for you to live that lifestyle apart. So if you separate for a little while, make it because you want to get closer to God and give yourselves to fasting and prayer and then get back together as soon as you can. Or the community in which you live will have its way with you. And it's just the way it is. The more we apart, the more we become like what the areas that we're apart from. And rather than grow together, we grow apart. It's just the way things work. We are told in chapter 8, verses 8 through 13, to help strengthen the weaker brother. We're told that uh, they used to offer meat in these sacrifices, and some people would take that meat and eat it and didn't have a problem. And others, they would say, that's from the temple, that sacrifice they're doing up on a hill. You don't want to eat that because it's given to idols. Now, McFarland isn't real picky about where the meat comes from. It doesn't affect me. I understand that the cow had no choice about whether or not it would be offered as an idol or not. But what we can do to help that situation is described here. Verses 8 through 9 in chapter 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. In other words, don't make a big deal about it and have a big barbecue and make a big thing about it. Hey, we went down to the temple this week and look at the great steaks we got. When somebody may have just come from that and that would hurt them. They, could, they would not be able to get their mind around it. The meat didn't affect us in any way, but it's your attitude. We can help a weaker brother who may not be walking the same way you do, who may not feel exactly the way you feel about some of the traditions of the New Testament church, some of the things that are neither doctrinal nor uh, are much more than preferential. Just don't provoke them unnecessarily. You know, it doesn't do a lot to be poked. I don't care what kind of poking you're doing. But you can be irritated, and there's nothing so as disabilitating as a small sticker in your hand. Cut me to the quick. Cut my arm off. I'll find a way around it, but I can't hardly walk if I have a sticker stuck in my finger until I get that out. And then, of course, you know how men do. I get a sticker. That means I need to now to go to dig to China to get it out. But it's out. I need stitches now, but it's out. It doesn't take much to irritate. It doesn't take much to take a new believer and cause them to be so discouraged they just don't think it's worth continuing because every little thing they do is wrong. They don't talk quite like we do. They're not living exactly like we do. And we have no patience. You came to know the Lord? You ought to know the book by now. Yeah, I just came to know the Lord yesterday. Thank you, but haven't even read. We have to have patience, and we must be willing to grow each other. Have patience when we need it. And of course, yes, there's discipline in the church, but we, do, we don't discipline in the church because we want to hurt people. It's also a growing experience. And then we strengthen ourselves from chapter 9. Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. Olympics are going to start here pretty soon. They're going to be kind of weird to watch, I guess, this year. But this is kind of what's being talked about. 
And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore not run so as to, ins- as and certainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it uh, uh, unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Many of us are great coaches because we think we know everything. <laughs> but you ever have somebody that talked a great game and then it came time for them to prove that? And they, all they were was the pages that they had read, the TV show they saw. Runners run. They win because they have training. They put time in. They're temperate. Temperate. That's nearly a whole movement of being having self-control. These are things we all struggle with, and why I make light of and in about from our diet to other things in life. The Corinthians needed to find some temperance, control. They were allowing all of their passions to be acted upon. Good food put before them, they didn't know to eat that. They grabbed the snicker bar every time. They didn't know how, a, know how to have a relationship with an individual that was something more than a physical liaison. They didn't know how all of these things worked because they weren't temperate. They needed to strengthen themselves. And we all have to do that self-evaluation. A lot of what I say on Sunday mornings, is it not about something, us working on this idea of my life and how I walk in the community and finding temperance in my life that I, what I say sounds different What I do sounds different. How I relate to people in the world is different because I know Christ. And that's because there's a discipline that goes with that. There's a great deal of fighters that can shadow box with the best of them. Man, they can give that, you know, that boxing bag, they can make that thing ring out. Put them in the line, put them in with Muhammad Ali, and they're done. But they got style. Growing up, uh, we called some of these individuals drugstore cowboys or Rexall Rangers. Looked like cowboy, but that's only because they had nice boots and a nice hat. Put them on a Bronco and see what they do. Put them in a real rodeo, see how much of a cowboy they are. Not much. But they looked good. And that's important, right? <laughs> we are working toward pleasing God rather than pleasing ourselves. Uh, chapter 10, verse 31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Enter into that same phrase. This is my catch-all phrase for people say, well, is it the will of God that I am filling that blank? Well, I said, well, if you can read this chapter 10, verse 31, and insert that into this verse, and it gives glory to God, then God's probably behind it. Well, I'm going to Las Vegas to gamble. Can you insert that into this verse and it sound right? Does this gambling give glory to God? Well, I don't know. Depends on how much you gamble. Now, the idea of gambling, what's wrong with it, isn't anything about you deserving to have some funds. That, you know, we're a little bit envious of somebody that has the rich uncle that dies and leaves them with all kinds of stuff. They go, well, that's nice that they now have an easier life because somebody has giving them a great fortune. I think I'll go get mine. 
So I'm off to Las Vegas. What are the chances of me coming back with more? You know the percentages. The problem is, is that God blesses us for our honest daily work. He, bl- he expects us to use that to be a blessing to others. You know, every dime every, that I make, there's a penny of it that ought to go back to the Lord to help others and to help this church to keep the lights on and do all the things that we do. I give back. That does not say to take that penny and waste it in Las Vegas with the hope that, ah, Lord, if you let me win the lottery, I'll give you a great tithe. How many times has the Lord heard that, do you think? I'll be a blessing to others like no one else will. Yeah, that's what your neighbor said just three seconds ago. Get a job. Do the best you can. Honor me with the substance and know that what you have, the job you have, is because doors open for me and I open them for you. Don't waste it. And this extended into their understanding of communion, that they needed to change their communion attitude. Communion, Lord's Supper, however... The terms are interchangeable for us. But this is the basis. We read this every time we have the Lord's Supper, just about, or verses that pertain to this text. But look at that. Verse 24 and 26 of chapter 11 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup, which when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this, uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. What's that leave us to do? It means that everything that surrounds the Lord's Supper is to make you You're not more saved after the Lord's Supper. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with what happens tomorrow and you're walking in the community. But for a few moments, your eyes are fixated on what God did for you. And we remember it. It's a memorial service that we celebrate. And whenever we celebrate it, there's no set time. We choose here in this church to observe it uh, mostly quarterly. About the same time, we switch our Sunday school literature out. Uh, It helps us be mindful. And uh, for a while, we've been observing that pretty much on that schedule. Within a few weeks or times, we... Sometimes move it around a little bit. But for a few moments, our eyes are to be fixated on what the Lord's done for us. Corinthians needed an attitude check because that's not why they were observing it. Unity of gifts work together in the body, and much of Corinthians tells us about spiritual gifting. Many of those gifts that have now gone by the wayside are no longer in uh, spiritual life, but nevertheless were dealt with at that time. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diverse differences of ministrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. What's the idea of that? Underline it. It's basically this. Don't be envious of the gift of given others. Use yours. What's your gift? How are you gifted in life to help? There may not be an exact representation of, your, of the way God has allowed you to be gifted in this world. We generally know <coughs> excuse me, that spiritual gifts are going to be used for the edifying, for the growth and uh, future of the New Testament church. But some people are gifted in a lot of ways that benefit the Lord's work. And they shouldn't be sorry that they didn't get the gift that someone else got. I've been in, in church where... They were dissensions and problems because so-and-so got to play the piano and -and so-and-so didn't get to. Why would that be? Jealousy. Sure. The idea is is that use your gift. And churches ought to help as much as possible for those gifts to be used and for us to find ways that those things can be continuing on. If the Lord gave you the gift, 
He's going to let you find a way to use it. We are told this, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, how we get into this body in the first place. For as the body is one, and many hath, mem- and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. I take a little exception here with the King James translation of this, in that if we explore the Greek language of this, the word by there is the Greek word in. And like 63 times out of 64 times that as used in the New Testament, It is translated equivalently with our English, I in. And so here should be translated, I in. And if we do that, then it's not about the Holy Spirit. It's about, small s, us being in common attitude. In other words, a singular little s means that it's a common thought or intent. Upon water baptism, we enter into the covenant of church membership. You need water baptism at the hands of a scriptural church to be able to enter into the membership of a New Testament church. And after having done that, you're in fellowship. And this is really what this is about. You don't join a church because you're at odds with it. You join a church because you seem to have some things in common with it. And we, in a common spirit, covenant together. Most Baptist churches, not just our fellowship, has this thing called a church covenant hanging on the wall. Many have taken that down and sometimes put it in different locations, but it's always a continual remember, remembrance to us that when we become a member of this New Testament church, we promise each other something. We promise we'll do the best to show up. We'll do the, pro- the best we can to seek its administration and its uh, care and well-being, and we're going to try to build it up. We're going to do the things that are natural for that. And if we leave this place and we go another place, we're going to try to find a church just like this one as best we can in that community. The things of the Word of God are in that covenant, but that is an individual promise. It's come to signify that we promise each other something. That means we're in lack accord. The thing that the Corinthian church was that it lacked accord. It lacked unity. Everybody's just doing whatever they want to do anytime they want to do it, and it's not benefiting. They are reminded God has gifted you. He's put you all together. Quit worrying about being an individual and now be part of the assembly. It unifies us to realize that we're all parts of this, and the book of Corinthians tells us No, not everybody's an arm. Not everybody's a leg. Not everybody can be the eye. But you're some part of that. And so am I. And our parts together work together. I know that the body as a whole senses and feels. Any parent that has walked down a corridor in the middle of the night barefooted and found a Lego understands that when you step on something sharp or you stub your toe, the whole body is upset about that. Right? If I'm hungry, don't you think my toe is also anticipating that? I've never asked them what they prefer. I've never seen if my elbow likes hamburgers or pot roast, or, but they seem to appreciate when I feed the whole body, the whole body does what it does. Because that's how it works. And the metaphor of this being the body of Christ is not lost because of that. We are one body in Christ, and the Christian church was having a struggle with that. We are told that love endures, but other gifts will cease. There are a number of gifts that were in the New Testament church at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians that are no longer in this assembly, no longer to be demonstrated among churches. And, uh, but there is something that endures. Quite a few 
a number of weddings begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's a lovely chapter about love. But do you understand that it's talking about spiritual gifts? The context of chapter 12, 13, and 14 are all about spiritual gifts in the New Testament church, particularly the church at Corinth at the time it existed. It says, and I'm reading the New King James Version of this, just to ease some of the wording, because I like the word love rather than charity. Charity's good, too. And if charity were here, we would say, excuse us. But uh, it means love. Verse 8, no, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues or languages, uh, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. How many spiritual gifts abide? These three abide. These three endure. These three never cease. Faith, hope, and love. And the top one, the one that you need above all the others, love. There comes a time when no longer did we have to worry about speaking and having the spiritual gift of languages, and that's what it was, that uh, I could go to Russia and witness, and I didn't have to learn Russia, I just had the spiritual gift. I could talk to them and they would understand me. Uh, not gibberish or things that are called tongues today in our world, but it was language. Dialectos was, is the Greek underline of that, and glossalia. Dealing with languages and the way we speak languages. If you had a spiritual gift, you didn't have to go to language school. Chapter 14 deals a lot with having the gift or a language to speak, and you get up in the middle of church and you start talking in a foreign language. You're going to need to have somebody translate that for you these days. And why is that? Because that's the way our world works these days. Chapter 14, we desire these spiritual gifts, and we know that the Lord is not the author of confusion. He speaketh uh, unknown tongues, speak to men. Chapter 14, verses 33 through 35, God is not the author of confusion, but peace is in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. So, as, so also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. Oh, that's controversial. I could preach a whole message about that. But let it suffice that we say this, that chapter 14, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, all these are dealing with you know, great extent, spiritual gifts. Gifts properly in use are the priority, and that is the prophecy or forth telling, preaching the word. The order is to be followed, it's to be steady and edifying, not an emotional theater. Authority is to be respected. Women are not the authoritative ministerial voice, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And Timothy tells us about the qualifications for pastoral ministry. But in the context of what we're talking about, spiritual gifts need to be used properly. And women are not to exercise these specific gifts that are mentioned. Number one, that they did not to use the gift of languages. They are, two, not to have uh, authoritative pastoral speaking or forth-telling. And three, the authoritative representation of church leadership over their husbands. In other words, when it came to demonstration of God's will and through his church, men we're supposed to stand up and be a representation to the community of that. It doesn't mean women cannot do everything that men can do, for the most part in church. But when it comes to the authoritative aspect of the New Testament church, uh, they are to set that role aside to men who will be pastors, 
because women are not to assume that duty, and that is the representative of authoritative teaching, uh, they are to let their husbands uh, take that stand for them. Can women teach? Yes. Can women do other things in the church? Yes. They have a great and effective ministry, and so do men. It's just that God has ordained that this should happen in a certain way. Finally, this morning, the resurrection is affirmed. One of the many questions even existing to this day that uh, we're told that the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, um, is told, he says, the Corinthians, you know that I declared you the gospel. And he says in verse 2, by which also you are saved. You know I've been telling you this. I've been telling you that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. And it's good news to you. And they are to be reminded that it is a mystery, but it is a victory. We just spent the uh, last uh, week or so here with dealing with those from our own membership that have passed and gone on to be with the Lord. And those were not, they were sad experiences, and yet they were joyful. There's a mystery. There's a mystery why? Because we, we put a physical body into a grave, but the spirit leaves on. And we're looking for a time when that resurrection will unite spirit and body then uh, if we believe that, and if you believe that the resurrection is true, then according to verse 14, this is what happens. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Jesus Christ is not living today, let's just pack it up, go home. We've wasted a lot of time today. But because he is risen, I am to be risen and it's a mystery. I'm not going to read all of, of verses uh, 51 through 58 this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You're familiar with it. But just to sit, hit some high points, you know it's a mystery. And you know that there's a day that corruptible puts on incorruption. I get changed out. I get a new body. And we can say to the grave, oh grave, where's your victory? Where's the sting? Well, that's not got a sting because we understand that, verse 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be as steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for I know that your labor is not vain in the Lord. We extend our care, finally, to understand that they are told we're taking up a collection for Jerusalem. You all need to help out as well. Concerning the collection for the saints, I have given you, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. We cooperate together. We, are, we have sister churches that have needs. We are to respond to them. We respond to people in our community. We do the things we need to do to extend ourselves so that our resources, we need to think bigger. We help our national work. I may not be doing mission work in Haiti, but there are areas in Haiti. How can we help? We help the churches that send them to Haiti. Help them with resources and pray for them and do the things that we need to do for missionaries. Support them. Because finally, as when we look at this, as in chapter 16, it says, Watch ye therefore, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity or love. Aid our associated work. Cooperate with efforts of our sister works. Grow up mature, there's that theme again, and do it in love. Not because you have to, because you want to and you love to do it. It means so much more when we love what we're doing and we do it out of love. I can't say that everything I do is perfectly oriented to that, but it's kind of fun. I've been on the doorstep when we've handed a sack of groceries to somebody. And I loved the experience because they needed it. And I love to be able to be the giver. And our church loves that experience. We've done that on numerous occasions. I have been a missionary in the field and I've had uh, people say, we were just praying for you the other day and just know that. Just to hear that you were praying for me was an amazing fact. And then those that would support the work as well, send offerings to help. It was a blessing. And they did it not because they were obligated, but because they loved it and they wanted to do that. And so should everything that we do. Corinthians, Madras, 
Whatever we do, do it out of love.